Hello, welcome back. Uh, glad that you could be here today. Um, let's go ahead and go right into the homework here in a minute. Uh, but let me just kind of give you a little reminder where we are right now. We've already done chapter 12, right? We're towards the end of chapter 13, although we still have some stuff in chapter 13. And then we're going to have chapter 15, and then we're going to have a test. Okay? So I don't know the test date for you all here face to face yet, and when I do know it, I'll actually announce it off cameras so I don't mess up the online people who will have a different, uh, different set of dates. Um, for you folks online, uh, always be checking the red calendar on the D2L website as far as the last day you can take that test. So we still have a little while, but I just kind of wanted to uh, bring it in a little bit and say we're through 12, we're almost through 13, we're going to go through 15, and then we're going to have a test over 12, 13, and 15. Okay? So that's something for you guys to look forward to. All right? Um, let's go ahead and go right into the homework. Uh, let's do the cash dividend example first. Okay? The cash dividend example. All right? Um, I believe that looked like this. Is that correct, guys? Okay. All right. On April 30th, the company declared a cash dividend of 25 cents per common share to the stockholders on record of May 18th. The cash dividend will be paid on May 30th. The company has 400,000 400, shares authorized and 280,000 shares outstanding. The par value of the stock is $2 a share. Prepare the required journal entries, if any, on April 30th, May 18th, and May the 30th. Okay? All right. Well, let's go ahead and do that. We know that on April the 30th, that is called the date of declaration. Is that right? The date of declaration. Is that correct? And then we know on May, no, not, is it May? Yeah. May the 18th, that is the date of, what do we call it? Record. And then on May the 30th, that is the date of payment. You with me? Okay. See if you can see all those there. Okay. Now, we know the journal entry on the date of declaration is we debit or reduce retained earnings. Retained earnings. Have we ever talked about retained earnings? No. Yo, you. Uh, yeah, retained earnings is a capital account with a credit balance. Thus, when we are debiting it here, that means we are reducing it, which makes sense because we're taking assets out of the company and giving, giving them to the owners. Okay? So back to the worksheet. We debit retained earnings and we credit common dividends payable. Correct? Now, the question is, it's 25 cents per common share. Do we take that 25 cents per share times 400,000 or times 280,000? What do you think? The outstanding one or the 280,000? The 280,000 outstanding. Okay. And what is that amount? Uh, 70,000. 70,000. Okay. So this is our journal entry on the date of declaration. Did you guys get that? Debit retained earnings, credit common dividends payable for 70000 Okay. All right, real quick though, let's remind ourselves what is the authorized and, and uh, outstanding? Authorized is how many shares the corporate charter gives us permission to sell or to issue. And outstanding is how many shares there are out there right now held by outside stockholders. Okay, so we had permission to sell 400,000 shares, but we've only, uh, there's only 280,000 outstanding, okay, at this moment. So you obviously don't pay dividends on what you have permission to, there's, who would even pay those to, right? Okay. All right, what is the journal entry on the date of record? There's none. No journal entry, right? Okay. And then the date of payment. Well, we just pay off this liability, right? We debit, we debit, 
common dividend payable for 70,000. And what do we credit for 70,000? Cash. Cash. It's just like the payment of any other liability. You debit or reduce the liability and you debit or you, let me say that again. You debit or reduce the liability and you credit cash, which is reducing cash, right? Now, this doesn't seem that hard to me, but I got to tell you, this, is a, this was a past test question I used for a number of, of semesters. People just bombed this, okay? Not sure why. I think it was that first entry, okay? So don't lose these easy points, okay? All right, questions on that, folks? Questions? All righty then. If not, I believe I asked you to do the bottom half of this handout. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Well, let's do that. Okay. All right. Can you see that? Okay. XYZ Company was organized in January 2011 and has 75,000 shares of $10 par value, 6% non-participating preferred stock outstanding, and 150,000 shares of $1 par value common stock outstanding. It is declared and paid cash dividends each year shown below. Calculate the total dividends distributed to each class of stockholder under each of the assumptions given. Okay. Now we're kind of shifting into that gear of, remember preferred stock? It's that separate class of stock that you might issue, and they have preference over the common shareholders in regards to dividends, for one thing. Okay, that's, that's what we're concentrating on here. Okay? All right, the very first thing we have to do is we have to figure out the total preferred dividends that will be given in one year if we have ample cash on hand. Remember how we do that? We take the number of preferred shares outstanding times the par value of the preferred stock times the stated value. Is that correct? All right. So what's the number of preferred shares outstanding? 75,000 shares times what's the par value? $10. $10 per share. And then what's the stated value? Right there, isn't it? 6%. Okay. So 75,000 times $10 times 6% equals what? 45,000? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So that is the amount that we will pay preferred shareholders in total for one year if we have the cash. Okay? You with me? All right. Well, let's do this. Okay? Don't even worry about this side for now. Okay? Don't even worry about that side for now. Let's say the preferred stock is not cumulative. The preferred stock is not cumulative. That means if we don't pay in previous years, we don't have to catch up those previous years with preferred, do we? Now, we have to pay the current year before we pay the common. Okay, remember? Preferred stock is not cumulative. Okay, 2011 comes. 2011 comes. Well, we wish we could, we wish we could give them 45,000, right? We can't. We only have 32. So how much do we give the preferred? 32. That's what we give them. We give them what we can. And the, the common get what? Nothing. They get nothing. And they like it. No, they don't like it. Okay? All right. Next. 2012, we have 70,000, right? Well, how much do we give to the preferred? 45,000, 45, right? We just have to give them the current year amount. Then how much do we have left to give the common? How much? 25,000. 25, okay. 
Next year comes, we only have 20,000 to give, okay? Well, we wish we could give the preferred 45, right? We, we don't have that much, but we'll give them what we have, which is 20,000, right? And then how much do Common get? Nothing. They get nothing. Last year, we get, no, we have $95,000 cash to pay out. So how much do we give the Common? Oh, I'm sorry, how much do we give the Preferred? 45. And then how much do we have left to give the common? Uh, how much? 50. 50. Okay, that's if the preferred stock is not cumulative. Is that correct? Okay, all right. Now let's say the preferred stock is cumulative. And remember, most preferred stock is cumulative. Okay, let's see how that works. Okay. Just ignore this for now, okay? Ignore this for now. Let's just look over here. Let's say the preferred stock is cumulative. Okay, 2011, we have $32,000 cash to give out. Well, we wish we could give the preferred 45, right? But we can't. But we give them what we have, 32,000. And common get what? Nothing. Common get what? Zero. Zero. Now, what is our dividends in arrears at this point? It is 13,000? Yes. Okay. Because we shorted them 13 grand, right? Between 45 and 32. So the dividends in arrears at this point is 13,000. Okay. Next year comes, we have 70,000 to give out in cash. Well, the first thing we do is we pay the dividends in arrears amount that we owe, which is 13,000, okay? Now we have to pay the current, we're caught up for prior years now, right? We're caught up for prior years, but we still have to pay the current year amount, is that correct? And what's the current year amount to preferred? 45. Now we're free and clear to pay the common shareholders some money. How much cash do we have left? 70 minus 13 minus 45 is $12,000. And what is the dividends in arrears at this point? Zero. Okay, dividends in arrears are zero. Okay, questions before we move on? Would you total it up? Well, I usually write it like this, but some people would put 58, and that's fine, too. Okay. I think it's kind of easier to break it down either way. Okay, next year comes, looks like a little, it's a little leaner on cash. We only have 20,000. Well, we wish we could give the preferred 45, but we, we give them what we can, which is 20,000. Common gets zero, right? What is our dividends in arrears after we, after we do this? 25,000, which is the 45 minus the 20 equals 25 that we shorted them. Next year, we have a lot of cash to give out, 95,000. The first thing we do is we pay our dividends in arrears of 25,000. Now we're caught up for prior years, but we still have to pay the current year amount of 45,000. Is that correct? Yeah. Now we're free and clear to give some cash to the common shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, how much cash do we have? 25,000, which is 95 minus 25 minus 45 equals. And what is our dividends in arrears after this? Zero. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on that? Where it says 150,000 shares of $1 par value, do we just like completely disregard that? Yeah, that's not needed, is it? For what they're asking us to do, that's not needed. Okay. Good point. Good point. Okay. All right. Great. Now I think we had a couple in the book. Did we not? 
So let's take a look at those. All right. Quick study 136, is that correct? Is that right, guys? Yep. All right. Quick study 136. All right. This is not too difficult to one, is it? All right. Quick study 13.6, right here. Okay. Prepare the journal entry to record Thomasine Company's issuance of 5,000 shares of $100 par value, 7%, cumulative preferred stock for $102 cash per share. And then they want us to, then they say, assuming the facts in part one, if the company declares a year end cash dividend, What's the amount of dividend that's going to be paid to preferred shareholders? Assume no dividends in arrears. Okay? All right. Well, let's do that. Okay? I don't think that one was too bad, was it? This was just talking about preferred stock. Okay? Okay, let's take a look first at the journal entry when we issue preferred stock. Okay? Well, we sold 5,000 shares for $102 per share, so we debit cash for $510,000, right? It's the same methodology as when we issue common stock. We credit preferred stock for the number of shares sold or issued times the par value. So that's 5,000 shares times $100 par value. We credit preferred stock for 500,000. Now you don't have to put $100 par value if you, want, if you don't want to there, but you do need to make sure you are crediting preferred stock. Don't just credit stock, never credit stock. Stock is not an account. It's either common stock or preferred stock, okay? But you need to make sure that you're crediting preferred stock, okay? And of course, that journal entry, if we look at this journal en entry right here by itself, that doesn't, that doesn't balance, does it? So we have to put the remainder, and I probably would have called it additional paid in capital. They called it paid in capital in excess of par value preferred stock for 10,000. Of course, the total debits have to equal the total credits. Correct? Okay. Any questions on? Quick study, 13, 6. Oh, we're not done. We have a second part, don't we? Okay. What's the amount that dividends of dividends paid to preferred shareholders in total for one year if we can pay them and there's no dividends in arrears? Well, once again, we take the number of preferred shares outstanding times the par value of the preferred stock times the stated rate of 7%. So that amount would be $35,000. That's that first amount that you have to figure out, isn't it? Okay? All right. Any questions on that, folks? I think now we have exercise 13.8 and 13.9, is that correct? Yes. All right, let's take a look at that. Okay, this is a lot like the one that we did on the handout. Just a different situation with different numbers, isn't it? They do it in the answer key. Uh, the format that they show in the solution is a little different. And uh, I don't care which way you do it. It's pretty much the same thing. It just looks a little differently. Um, but let's go ahead and read this first. Okay. Exercise 13.8, okay? All right. York's outstanding stock consists of 80,000 shares of non-cumulative 7.5% preferred stock with a $5 par value and also 200,000 shares of common stock with a $1 par value. During its first four years of operation, the corporation declared and paid the following total cash dividends. And you can see those amounts there. Determine the amount of dividends paid each year to each of the two classes of stockholders, preferred and common. And then they also want us to, in this case, total it up. We, I don't think we totaled it. 
uh, in the other example, but that's okay. All right, let's go ahead and go through this. Now, the first situation, it's non-cumulative, correct? It's non-cumulative. So this is non-cumulative, okay? Well, the first year we have 20000 to pay out. Oh, what's the first thing we have to do? What is the first thing that we have to do? Figure out the... The very first thing that you have to do is figure out one full year amount of preferred shareholders or preferred dividends if they get paid, right? Okay, that's the first thing we have to do. Did you get 30000 Yep. Okay. How did we get that? We took the par value, which was what? Five. Well, let's actually, let's do it in the same order. What's the number of preferred shares outstanding? 80000 And what's the par value? Five. $5 per share. And then what's the stated rate? 7.5. Seven, seven and a half percent. Okay. And did, did you get that? $30,000. Okay. So that is the amount of one full year of preferred dividends if we have the cash to pay out and if there's no dividends in arrears. That's the amount we need first of all, right? Okay. Once we have that, then we can go on. First year, we have $20,000 to pay out. Well, we wish we could give the preferred $30,000, but we can only give them $20,000. The common get zero, right? And this is non-cumulative, so we don't keep track of dividends in arrears. Second year, we have $28,000. Well, we wish we could give them thirty. dollars We can only give them twenty-eight. dollars Common get zero, right? The next year, we have $200,000. A lot more cash on hand. Well, how much do the preferred get? 30,000. 30, <laughs> and then the remainder, the 170, the 200 minus the 30, the 170 goes to common. And then finally, in 2016, we have 350,000 to pay out. The preferred still get 30. The common get 320,000 which is the 350 minus the 30 equals 320. And if you total them all up, these, these are the amounts that you get. Okay, 108 and 490. I'd rather be a common stockholder. Well, it's a great point that you bring up, Daniel. He says he's re he'd rather be a common shareholder. Well, what if you were asking that question, looking at the handout, what if you were asking which would you rather be at this point? You might say you'd rather be a preferred shareholder, right? This is, this, is a, this is a good reminder of, can you see that, let me back up a little bit. Can you see that in lean years you might be, you might be glad that you're a preferred shareholder? But in years of plenty you might wish you were a common shareholder? Okay. Yep. That goes back to the risk and the reward of investments, doesn't it? Okay. Different investors, think about the people who are buying stock. They have different risk preferences, don't they? Okay? It's kind of like this. In lean years, when the economy is really bad, I wish my, my uh, investments would have all just been in treasury bills or treasury bonds, right? That pay maybe even just, what, 2% or something like that? But when the economy is going really bad, I would wish my, my money was there. But when the economy is really, really good, I would hope that my money was in investments that are a little more higher risk but higher return, like mutual funds or, or blue chip stocks or something like that, right? Okay? Different risk, different rewards. Okay? So, good point there. All right. That's if the stock is non cumulative. Now let's take a look at if the stock is instead cumulative. And most preferred stock is cumulative, isn't it? Okay. Well, we still know that one full year of dividends is how much? 30,000, right? 
Okay, so let's go through this. But let's go ahead and put that 30,000 up here as a reminder because that's one full year of preferred dividends if we have the cash to pay and if there's no dividends in arrears. Okay, now we're talking cumulative preferred stock. The first year we have 20,000 to pay out. We wish we could give them 30. We can only give them 20. We give them what we have. Common gets zero, right? And at this point, what is the dividends in arrears? Okay. Next year comes, we have 28,000 to pay out. Well, the first thing that we do is we pay the dividends in arrears of $10,000 to the preferred. Okay, now we're caught up for prior years. Now let's talk about the current year. Well, how much money do we have left at this point for this year? Well, we had 28. We just paid 10,000 to cover those dividends and arrears. We now have 18,000. We wish we could give them 30, but we can only give them 18,000. Now we're out of cash, so common gets zero, okay? The totals for the year. And what's the dividends and arrears at this point? $12,000. Next year comes, we have 200000 to pay out, correct? First thing we do is we pay those dividends in arrears of $12,000. Now we're caught up for prior years. How much do we pay for the current year? 30000 Now we're free and clear to give some money to the common shareholders. How much cash do we have left? 200 minus 12 minus 30 equals 158. Is that correct? What's the dividends in arrears at this point? Zero. Next year comes, we have 350000 to pay out. We have no dividends and arrears to pay, but we do pay the 30000 for the current year. Now we're free and clear to pay common. So how much do we have left? 350 minus 30 equals 320. And of course, there's no dividends and arrears at this point. And if we total those up, this is how much there is for all four years for each category of stock. All right. Okay. Questions on that, folks? Okay. The next thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about participating versus non-participating preferred stock. Okay. These are two terms you might have read about. Let's talk about non-participating first because most preferred stock is non-participating. This is a situation where dividends are limited to that stated value amount. So even in those years of plenty, you do not get paid more. Does that make sense? Even in those years of plenty, if you're a preferred shareholder, you do not get paid above that stated rate. Okay? You're, it's non-participating. Think of it this way. You, you, you are non you are not participating in those years of plenty. You're still just getting your set amount. You with me? Now, there is something called participating preferred stock, where in some situations, dividends can exceed the stated amount. But that is pretty rare. Okay? I, I don't think I've ever seen it. Okay? Most preferred stock is non-participating. Okay? All right. I want to go to this next slide and say, why would a company issue preferred stock? Now, we're not saying, why would somebody buy preferred stock? We're saying, why would a company issue preferred stock? Let's actually go back to the document camera, and I want to show you something here. Kind of a nice little summary. Okay? All right. These are some different alternatives for raising capital for your company. Okay? Let's say you need to raise capital. You need money, in other words. Okay? Well, you could issue common stock, right? You could issue common stock. Okay? Now, one thing about common stock is, if I can pick up my little post-it, you sell ownership of your company. So you've lost some control, haven't you? So I'll put a little sad face there. If you issue common stock, common stockholders have voting rights. Is that correct? Okay. Now, one good thing about issuing common stock 
is you are not required to pay dividends. That's a happy face. So in lean times, if you don't have cash, you don't have to pay dividends. Is that correct? Okay. So this is the good and the bad of issuing common stock as an alternative if you want to raise capital for your company. Now the other thing that you could do is you could get a loan, couldn't you? We're gonna, that's actually called issuing debt. Okay? You could issue debt. We'll talk about that in, in chapter 14. Now, the great thing about issuing debt is you maintain, you maintain control of your company. Okay? The bank may act like they own your company, but they don't. They don't affect decisions, they don't vote, or anything. You maintain control. That's a happy face, right? Okay? The drawback, though, to getting a loan, and some of you know this, you are required to pay back principal and interest. So even if you have a lean period where you have very little cash, you have to pay back principal and interest, don't you? Okay? So there is the good and the bad of issuing debt. Okay? Now let's expand this though and say, well, one alternative is you could issue preferred stock. You could issue preferred stock. Well, if you issue preferred stock, you maintain control of your company because they can't vote, can they? They can't vote. So that's a happy face. The other nice thing is, is you are not required to pay dividends, are you? So that's a happy face right there, too. Okay? So that's kind of a nice summary between three ways that one can raise capital, and it, and it points out to why somebody might issue preferred stock. Now, somebody might say, well, why don't you just issue preferred stock? Well, if you issue preferred stock, but it's not preferred over anything, the, the supply and demand curves are probably going to make that market price pretty small, and when you sell it, you're not going to get much capital, right? Okay. The computer slides say it a different way. They say somebody might uh, sell preferred stock to raise capital without sacrificing control. Or they might do it to boost the return by common shareholders. Okay, now what does this mean, financial leverage? All this means is this. Come off the slides for a second. Daniel, if you could borrow money at 5% and invest it in something that guaranteed would pay you 8%, should you do that? Yeah. You should do it as much as you can, okay? Because your cost of capital or cost of money is less than what you're earning. The common shareholders say the same thing about issuing preferred stock. If you can issue preferred stock at, say, a 5% stated rate and cost and invest it in the company as far as new products or new technology and earn 8% return for them, are they going to be happy you did that? Yes, that's going to increase their return on common stock. Does that make sense? It's the same principle. Okay. And then lastly, as the slide says, we might... Uh, issue preferred stock to appeal to investors who may believe the common stock is too risky. Okay? Or, like we said, it's, it's a matter of risk and return. Some investors might like preferred stock. All right? Okay, now we're going to move on to something called treasury stock. What is treasury stock? Treasury stock represents shares of a company's own stock that has been reacquired. Okay? Now, why might a company buy its own stock back? Regain control. Well, they might they re regain control. Use their shares. They might use those shares to buy other companies, maybe put it into a package where they're going to buy another company. As Daniel said, to avoid a hostile takeover, perhaps. Maybe they're going to package it as compensation to employees. Okay? And there is some thought that, some theory that as far as supporting the market price, that if you go into the market and buy back some of your own stock, it, is a, it supports the market price a bit. Okay? Now let's take a look at this. The best way to learn about treasury stock is to do some examples. Okay? 
So we are going to walk through a little situation here. Follow along. On May 8, Wit Inc. purchased $2,000 of its own shares of stock in the open market for $8,000. Okay. Uh, so what was the cost per share? If they purchased $2,000 for $8,000, what was the cost per share? It's four dollars, and I want you to remember that. It's four dollars per share cost that we bought it back at. Okay, so what we do is we debit treasury stock and credit cash for eight thousand dollars. Okay? Now, look at that journal entry, guys. Every fiber of your being seems to seems to want to think that treasury stock is an asset. It is not an asset. Treasury stock is not an asset. It is what we call a contra equity. You remember the word contra means opposite, right? Equity normally has a credit balance, so a contra equity has a debit balance. Treasury stock, though, is not an asset. It is shown as a reduction in total stockholders' equity in the balance sheet in the equity section. Is treasury stock an asset? No. What is it? Contra, Contra equity. equity. It's a favorite test question of mine. Okay. So we purchased 2,000 shares of our own stock in the open market for $8,000. Then, a little later, we sold 100 shares of that treasury stock for $4 per share. Now, this was the same price that we bought it back. This was our cost, right? So we sold 100, 100 times 4, cash is debited for 400, treasury stock is credited. 400. Okay, that's pretty easy, isn't it? So that's if we sell it at cost. That's if we sell the treasury stock at our cost of $4 that we purchased it from the market at. Well, what if we sell the treasury stock above cost? Let's say we sell an additional 500 shares of its treasury stock for $7 per share. Well, let's build the journal entry. Well, we sold 500 shares for $7. We debit cash for $3,500. We debit cash for the 500 shares times the $7 market price, right? We credit treasury stock for the 500 shares times that cost of how much was it? Four bucks. And that equals $2,000. Now, that journal entry doesn't balance. So what do we credit? We credit paid in capital T stock. Okay? Paid in capital T stock. Okay? Now I am going to do a T account for this paid in capital T stock account. And this should be its own account. Okay? We credited it for fifteen hundred dollars okay I'll show you why we're doing that here in a second but going back to the computer does this make sense when we sell treasury stock above cost what happens if we sell it below cost well we're gonna see what happens let's say we sell an additional 400 shares of our treasury stock for a dollar fifty per share well how much cash comes in four hundred times what we sold it for, $1.50, which is $600 debit to cash. Then we credit treasury stock for 400 shares times what was our cost of it? Four, Four which is $1,600. Does that journal entry balance? No. What do you think we debit? We debit paid in capital treasury stock for $1,000 because we can, and you're going to see why I say that here in a minute. But that is our journal entry. Questions? Let's take that over to the T account for paid in capital treasury stock. Now I'm going to credit it for $1,000. What's our balance in this account? 500 credit balance. Credit balance of 500. Remember that. Let's go back to the computer. Now, on September 2, we sell an additional 600 shares of our treasury stock for $2 per share. 
Once again, this is below cost. Well, how much cash came in? Well, we sold 600 shares times 2. That equals 1,200. We credit treasury stock for 600 shares times what was the cost? Remember what the cost was? $4. $4. That equals 2,400. Now, it may seem that the next step to balance this journal entry is to debit additional paid in capital for treasury stock for 1200 but we can't do that. Our balance in paid in capital and treasury stock is a credit of 500 Listen to me. This cannot have a debit balance. Paid in capital treasury stock cannot have a debit balance. It can have a zero balance or a credit balance, but it can't have a debit balance. Is that only for treasury stock? Paid in capital treasury stock, well, there is some rules for other additional paid in capital, but this is the only one you need to worry about. Okay? So, knowing that this has a $500 credit balance, going back to the computer, we can debit paid in capital treasury stock for $500. That will take that account down to zero. Okay? Once we do this, it will take this down to zero. Well, this journal entry doesn't balance, so what we, do we debit for the rest of it? Earnings. Retained earnings. How'd you know? It's on your handout, right? Yeah. We debit or reduced retained earnings. Okay? So this seems maybe kind of tricky, but it's not really too bad once you, uh, once you do an example. And we're going to do an example right now. Okay, we're going to work on it for a few minutes. Yeah? Just a question. Could a company use this treasury stock, like buying their stock back, as a way to gain profit? Like Apple's going to release the next big product, so they buy a bunch of their stock, announce it, and then sell it at the higher prices. Can they do that to make more money? Or Well, I don't know. There's a lot of different factors in that as far as the perfect market theory and those, what's built into that stock price. I mean, it's a risk, of course. Too. Yeah, it is a risk. It is a risk. And you hope that when you buy that stock back, you continue to hope the stock price will go up. Mm -hmm. You do. But I'm not sure if the stock price was going to go up, if that would be your first thought, to, to buy treasury stock and then resell it. So um, I guess it could be. Never really thought about it that way. So it's a good question, though. Just curious. You definitely are going to hope the stock price goes up. You always hope that. Okay. Okay, what I want to work on right now, and you folks here probably are, may not have enough time to finish this whole thing. You folks at home, uh, you can always pause us and start us when you're done. But I want to work on this handout while they play the music uh, on uh, the Chapter 13 Treasury Stock handout, okay? See how much of this you can get done, okay? And... Uh, let's go ahead and work on that while they play the music. All right.
Okay, folks at home, if you're not done and you're probably not, just pause us and push play when uh, you are done, okay? So let's go ahead and go through this. All right. Uh, on, on April 4, Oxy purchased 1,000 shares of its stock, of its own stock in the open market for a total amount of $10,000, okay? Well, we debit treasury stock and credit cash for $10,000, correct? All right. Now, what was our cost per share? Let's go ahead and write that up here. Our cost per share was what? $10 a share. Okay? Let's keep that in mind as we go through this. So that's our journal entry when we buy our treasury stock. And by the way, this treasury stock is not an asset. What is it? You remember? It's a contra equity. All right. Okay. On May 17th, Oxy sold 350 shares of its treasury stock for $12 per share. Well, how much cash came in? 350 times 12, which is what? 4,200. Okay. We are going to credit treasury stock. For the number of shares sold, 350 times that cost of $10, right? So that is $3,500, is that correct? Is that right? Mm -hmm. So what do we credit for $700? Paid in capital treasury stock. Yes. Uh, additional paid in capital treasury stock. I'm abbreviating a little bit. Okay. Now. Let's go ahead and do a T account for additional paid in capital treasury stock. So we're going to credit that for $700. Okay. Next, on August 19th, we sold 200 shares of our treasury stock for $8 per share. Well, how much cash comes in? $1,600. We credit treasury stock for the number of shares sold times that cost of $10. So 200 shares times $10 cost is $2,000. That doesn't balance, right? Well, the, eight, the additional paid in capital T stock has a 700 credit balance. So it can, it can handle the whole 400 debit, can't it? So that's our journal entry. Let's post that up here. Now this has a 300 balance to the credit, right? Lastly, on September 19th, we sell the remaining shares of treasury stock for $7 per share. How many shares is that, by the way? That's 1,000 minus 350 minus 200. That's 450 shares. So 450 times 7 is how much? I got 3150. That's what I got. Cash of 3150. Okay. We credit treasury stock. For the number of shares, 450 shares, times the cost of $10 per share, so for $4,500, right? Okay, this doesn't balance, right? But our additional paid in capital for treasury stock can't handle the whole amount, can it? We can only debit it for $300. This will bring it down to a zero balance, okay? But additional paid in capital treasury stock cannot have a credit, it cannot have a debit balance. Okay, did I say that right? It had a credit balance of 300, so we can debit it for 300, which will take it to a zero, but we can't bring it to a debit balance. 
And then the remainder of that, which I think is 1050, goes to retained earnings. Okay? Does that make sense, folks? All right. For you folks here, I'm sorry we had to rush through that a little bit, but um, I want to make sure I send you on your way with a completed example. Okay? All right, let me give you the homework, and you can be on your way. All right. Uh, there's a good chance we'll start chapter 15 next time. So you'll want to get those uh, chapter 15 PowerPoints. Note, note that we're not going on to chapter 14 at this time. We're going to chapter 15. Okay. So the homework I want you to do is exercise 13.5. And I want you to do exercise 13.10, but you only need to do requirement 1A, 1B, and 1C. All right? Okay. Thanks a lot, guys.